Section 3 of Aunt Judy's Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Aunt Judy's Tales by Margaret Gatty. Cook Stories. Down to, down at your own fireside with the evil tongue and the evil ear for each is at war with mankind tennyson's maud aunt judy had gone to the nursery wardrobe to look over some clothes and the little ones were having a play to themselves as she opened the door they were just coming out to the end of an explosive burst of laughter in which all the five appeared to have joined and which they had some difficulty in stopping number four who was a biggish girl had giggled till the tears were running over her cheeks and number eight in sympathy was leaning back in his tiny chair in a sort of ecstasy of amusement the five little ones had certainly hit upon some very entertaining game they were all boys and girls alike dressed up as elderly ladies with bits of rubbishy finery on their heads and round their shoulders to imitate caps and scarfs the boy's hair being neatly parted and brushed down the middle and they were seated in form round what was called the doll stable a concern just large enough to allow of a small crockery tea surface with cups and saucers and little plates being set out upon it what have you got there was all aunt judy asked as she went up to the table to look at them cowslip's tea was number four's answer laying out her hand on the fat pink teapot and thereupon the laughing explosion went off nearly as loudly as before though for no accountable reason that aunt judy could divine it's so good aunt judy do taste it exclaimed number eight jumping up in a great fuss and holding up his little cup full of a pale buff fluid to aunt judy you'll have everything over cried number four calling him to order and in truth the table was not the steadiest in the world so number eight sat down again calling out in an almost stuttering hurry you may keep it all aunt judy i don't want any more but neither did aunt judy after she had given it one taste so she put the cup down thanking number eight very much but pulling such a funny face that it set the laugh going once more in the middle of which number four dropped an additional lump of sugar into the rejected buff coloured mixture a proceeding which evidently gave number eight a new relish for the beverage aunt judy had got beyond the age when cowslip tea was looked upon as one of the treats of life and she had not on the other hand lived long enough to love the taste of it for the memory's sake of the enjoyment it once afforded not but what we are obliged to admit that cowslip tea is one of those things which even in the most enthusiastic days of youth just falls short of the absolute perfection one expects from it even under those most favourable circumstances of having had the delightful gathering of the flowers in the sweet sunny fields the picking of them in the happy holiday afternoon the permission to use the best doll's tea service for the feast the loan of a nice white tablecloth and the present of half a dozen pure knives and forks to fancy cut the biscuits with nay even in spite of the addition of well-fitted doll's sugar pot and cream jugs cowslip tea always seems to want either a little more or a little less sugar or a little more or a little less cream or to be a little more or a little less strong to turn it into that complete nectar which of course it really is on the present occasion however the children had clearly got hold of some other source of enjoyment over the annual cowslip tea feast besides the beverage itself and aunt judy glad to see them so safely happy went off to her business at the wardrobe 
while the little ones resumed their game very extraordinary indeed ma'am began one of the fancy old ladies in a completely fancy voice a little affected or so most extraordinary ma'am i may say here there was a renewed giggle from number four which she carefully smothered in her handkerchief but still i think i can tell you of something most extraordinary still the speaker having at this point refreshed his ideas by a sip of the pale-coloured tea and the other ladies having laughed heartily in anticipation of the fun that was coming one of them observed you don't say so ma'am then clicked astonishment with her tongue against the roof of her mouth several times and added impressively pray let us hear i shall be most happy ma'am resumed the first speaker with a graceful inclination forward well you see it was a party i had invited some of my most distinguished friends really ma'am fashionable friends i may say to dinner and ahem you see some little anxiety always attends such affairs even in the best regulated families here the speaker winked considerably at number four and laughed very loudly himself at his own joke dear me you must excuse me ma'am he proceeded so you see i felt a little fatigued by my morning's exertions to tell you the truth there had been no end of bother about everything and i retired quietly upstairs to take a short nap before the dressing bell rang but i had not then laid down quite half an hour when there was a loud knock on my door really ma'am i was quite alarmed but was just able to ask who's there before i had time to get an answer however the door was burst open by the housemaid her face was absolute scarlet and she sobbed out oh ma'am what shall we do good gracious anna cried i what can be the matter has the suit come down the chimney speak tis nothing of that sort ma'am answered hannah it's the cook the cook i shouted i wish you would not be so foolish hannah but speak out at once what about cook please ma'am the cook's lost says hannah we can't find her your wits are lost hannah i think cried i and sent her to tidy the rooms while i slipped downstairs to look for the cook fancy a lost cook ma'am was there ever such a ridiculous idea and on the day of the dinner party too did you ever hear of such a trial to a lady's feelings before never i am sure responded the lady opposite did you ma'am turning to her neighbour but the other three ladies all shook their heads bit their lips and declared that they never had they were sure i thought not ejaculated the narrator well ma'am i went into the kitchen the larder the pantries the cellar and all sorts of places and still no cook do you know she really was nowhere actually ma'am the cook was lost shouts of laughter burst forth here but the lady who was number five put up his hand and called out in his own natural tones stop i haven't got to the end yet order proclaimed number four immediately in a very commanding voice and thumping the table with the head of an old wooden doll to enforce obedience and then the sham lady proceeded in some wincing voice as before well dear me i am not put out but however you see what was to be done that was the thing i wanted only half an hour to dinner time and there was the meat roasting away by itself and the potato pan boiling over you never heard such a fizzling as it made in your life in short everything was in a mess and there was no cook well i basted the meat for a few minutes took the potato pan off the fire and then ran upstairs to put on my bonnet thought i the best thing i can do is to send somebody for the policeman and let him find the cook 
but while i was tying the strings of my bonnet i fancied i heard a mysterious noise coming out of the bottom drawer of my wardrobe fancy that man with my nerves in such a state from the cook being lost number five paused and looked around for sympathy which was the most freely given by the other ladies in the shape of sighs and exclamations the drawer was a very deep drawer ma'am so i thought perhaps the cat had crept in continued number five well i went to it to see and there it was partly open with a cotton gown in it that didn't belong to me imagine my feelings at that ma'am so i pulled out the handles to get the drawer quite open but it wouldn't come it was as heavy as lead it was really very alarming one doesn't like such odd things happening but at last i got it open though i tumbled backwards as i did so and what do you think ma'am ladies what do you think was in it the cook shrieked number four convulsed with laughter and the whole party clapped their hands and roared applause the cook ma'am actually the cook pursued number five one of the fattest most paunchy little women you ever saw and what do you think was the history of it i kept my upstairs pickwick in the corner of that bottom drawer she had seen it there that very morning when she was helping to dust the room and took the opportunity of a spare half hour to slip up and rest herself by reading it in the drawer ma'am you see and teaching people to read all the cooks in the country are spoilt peals of laughter greeted this wonderfully witty concoction of number fives and the lemon-coloured tea and biscuits were partaken of during the pause which followed aunt judy meanwhile who had been quite unable to resist joining in the laugh herself was seated on the floor behind the open door of the wardrobe thinking to herself of certain passages in wordsworth's most beautiful ode in which she has described the play of children as if their whole vocation were endless imitation truly they had got hold here of strange fragments from their dream of human life where could the children have picked up the original of such absurd nonsense aunt judy had no time to make it out for now the mincing voices began again and she sat listening have you had no curious adventures with your maids ma'am inquires number five of number four number five makes an attempt at a bewitching grin as he speaks faming himself with a fan which he has in his hand all the time he was telling his story well ladies replied number four only just able to compose herself to talk i don't think i have been quite as fortunate as yourselves in having so many extraordinary things to tell my servants have been sadly commonplace and done just as they ought but still once ladies once a curious little incident did occur to me oh ma'am i entreat you pray let us hear it burst from all the ladies at once number four had to bite her lip to preserve her gravity and then she turned to number five the fan if you please ma'am the rule was that one fan was placed at the disposal of the story-teller for the time so number five handed it to number four with a graceful bow and number four wafted to and fro immediately and began her account people are so unscrupulous you see ladies about giving characters it's really shocking for my part i don't know what the world will come to at last we shall all have to be our own servants i suppose people say anything about anything that's the fact only fancy ma'am three different ladies once recommended a cook to me at the best soup maker in the country now that sounded a very high recommendation for of course if a cook can make soups she can do anything sweetmeats and those kind of things follow of themselves so ma'am i took her and had a dinner party and ordered two soups entirely that i might show off what a good cook i had got think what a compliment to her and how much obliged she ought to have been well ma'am i ordered the two soups as i said 
one white and the other brown and everything appeared to be going on in the best possible manner when as i was sitting in the drawing-room entertaining the company i was told i was wanted when i got out of the room there was the man i had hired to wait and says he if you please ma'am where are the knives i can't find any at all the knives says i dear me don't come to me about the knives ask the cook of course please ma'am i have asked her and she only laughed then said i ask the housemaid it's impossible for me to come out and look for the knives well ladies continued number four would you believe it could any one believe it when i sat down to dinner and began to help the soup no sooner had the silver ladle my ladle is silver ladies been plunged into the taurine than a most singular rattling was heard william cried i half in a whisper to the waiter who was holding the plate what in the world is this surely cook has not left the bones in please ma'am i don't know was all the man could say well there was no remedy now so i dipped the ladle in again and lifted out oh ma'am i know if it was anybody but myself who told you you wouldn't believe it a ladle full of lost knives there they were my best beautiful ivory handles all in the white soup and while i'm discovering them the gentleman at the other end of the table had found all the kitchen knives with black handles in the brown soup then never was anything so mortifying before and what do you think was cook's excuse when i approached her please ma'am said she i read in the young women's vodemicum of instructive information page a hundred and fifty that there was nothing in the world so strengthening and wholesome as dissolved bones and ivory dust so ma'am i always make a point of throwing in a few knives into every soup i have the charge of for the sake of the handles ivory handles for white soups ma'am and black handles for the browns thunders of applause interrupted cook's excuse at this point and number seven was so overcome that he pushed his chair back and performed three distinct somersets on the floor to the complete disorganization of his headdress which consisted of a turban from beneath which hung a cluster of false curls turban and wig being replaced however and number seven reseated and composed number four proceeded cook generally takes them out she informed me ladies before the tureens come to table but said she my back was turned for a minute here ma'am and that stupid william carried them off without asking if they were ready it's all william's fault ma'am don't want to stay for i don't like a place where the man who waits has no tact now ladies exclaimed number four what do you think of that by way of a speech from a cook and i assure you that a medical man's wife to whom i mentioned in the course of the evening what cook had said about dissolved bones told me that her husband had only laughed and said cook was quite right so she hired the woman that night herself and i have been told in confidence since you'll not repeat it therefore of course ladies of course not came from all sides well then i was told that before the year was out the family hadn't a knife that would cut anything they were so cankered with rust so much for education and learning to read as you justly observed ma'am before when the emotions produced by this tale had a little subsided number seven was called upon for his experience of maids number seven with the turban on his head and a fine red necklace round his throat said he took very little notice of the maids but that he once had had a very tiresome little boy in buttons who was extremely fond of sugar and always carried the sugar shaker in his pocket and ate up the sugar that was in it and when it was empty filled it up with magnesia but once he added ladies he actually put some soda in it it was a party and we had our first rhubarb tart for the season and the company sprinkled it all over with the soda 
and began to eat but they were too polite to say how nasty it was but of course when i was helped i called out and what do you think the boy in buttons said nobody could guess so number seven had to tell them he said he had put it in on purpose because he thought it would correct the acid of the pie so i said he had best be apprenticed to a doctor so he went i dare say ma'am it was the same doctor who took your cook but i never heard of him any more and i've never dared to have a boy in buttons again a very wise decision ma'am i'm sure cried aunt judy who came up to the wonderful tea-table in the midst of the last bound of applause and now may i ask what game this is that you are playing at oh we're telling cook stories aunt judy cried number six seizing her by the arm they're such capital fun i wish you had heard mine they were laughing at it when you first came in it must have been delicious to judge by the delight it gave replied aunt judy smiling and kissing number six's oddly bedizened upturned face and what i want to know is what put cook stories as you call them into your head oh don't you remember and here followed a long account from number six of how about a week before the little ones had gone somewhere to spend the day and how it had turned out a very rainy day so that they could not have games out of doors with their young friends as had been expected but were obliged to sit a great part of the time in the drawing-room putting chinese puzzles together into stupid patterns and playing at fox and goose while the ladies were talking grown-up conversation as number six worded it among themselves and of course being on their own good behaviour and very quiet they could not help hearing what was said and oh dear aunt judy continued number six now with both her arms holding aunt judy of whom she was very fond except at lesson times round the waist it was so odd number seven and i did nothing at last but listen and watch them for little miss who sat with us was shy and wouldn't talk and it was so very funny to see the ladies nodding and making faces at each other and whispering and exclaiming how shocking how abominable you don't say so and all that kind of thing well but what was shocking and abominable and all that kind of thing inquired aunt judy oh i don't know things the nurses the cooks the boys in buttons did almost all the ladies had some story to tell all the servants had done something or other queer but especially the cooks aunt judy there was no end to the cooks so one day after we came back and we didn't know what to play at i said do let us play at telling cook stories like the ladies act so we've dressed up and played at cook stories ever since dear aunt judy i wish you could invent a cook story yourself was the conclusion of number six's account so then the mystery was out aunt judy's wonderings were cut short out of the real life of civilized intelligent society had come those fragments from their dream of human life which aunt judy had called absurd nonsense indeed it was but aunt judy was seized by the idea that some good might be got out of it so in the answer to number six's wish she said with a shy smile i don't think i could tell cook stories half as well as yourself but if by the way of change you would like a lady's story instead perhaps i might be able to accomplish that a lady story oh but that would be so dull wouldn't it inquired number six you can't make anything funny out of them surely surely they never do half such odd things as cooks and boys and buttons the ladies themselves think not of course was aunt judy's reply but what do you think aunt judy oh i don't think it matters what i think the question is what do cooks and boys and buttons think but aunt judy ladies are never tiresome and idle and impertinent like cooks and boys and buttons oh if you had but heard the real cook stories 
those ladies told i say let me tell you one or two i do think i can remember them if i try then don't try on any account dear number six exclaimed aunt judy i like make-believe cook stories much better than real ones so do i cried number seven they are so much more entertaining and not a bit less useful subjoined aunt judy with a sly smile well i didn't see much good in the real ones pursued number seven in a sort of muse let us tell you another make-believe one then cried number six who saw that aunt judy was moving off and wanted to detain her then it's my turn shouted number eight jumping up and stretching out his arm and hand like a young orator flushed to his work and actually before the rest of the little ones could put him down to stop him number eight contrived to tumble out the cook story idea which had probably been brewing in his head all the time of aunt judy's talk it was very brief and this was it delivered in much haste and with all the earnestness of a maiden's speech i had a button boy too and he was a what do you call it oh a rascal that was it he was a rascal and liked the currants and mince pies so he took them all out and ate them up and put in glass beads instead so when the people began to ear their teeth crunched against the beads ah bah how nasty it was number eight accompanied this remark with a corresponding grimace of disgust and then observed in conclusion perhaps he found it in a book but i don't know where after which he lowered his outstretched arm smiled and sat down the company clapped applause and number four especially must have been very fond of laughing for the glass bead anecdote set her off again as heartily as ever and the rest followed in her wake and while so doing ever noticed that aunt judy had slipped away they soon discovered it however when their mirth began to subside but before they had time to wonder much there appeared from behind the door of the wardrobe a figure which in their secret souls they knew to be aunt judy herself although it looked a great deal stouter and had a thick filled cap on its head a white linen apron over its gown and a pair of spectacles on its nose at sight of it they showed signs of clapping again but stopped short when it spoke to them as a stranger and willingly received it as such ah it is one of the sweet features of childhood that it yields itself up so readily to any little surprise or delusion that is prepared for its amusement no nasty pride no disinclination to be carried away no affected indifference interfere with young children's enjoyment of what is offered them they will even help themselves to be pleasant visions by an effort of will and perhaps now and then end by partly believing what they at first received voluntarily as an agreeable make-believe if therefore after the cook figure of aunt judy had seated itself by the doll's table and the little ones had looked and grinned at it for some time hazy sensations began to steal over one or two minds and this was somehow really a cook it was all in the natural course of things that nobody resisted the feeling aunt judy's altered voice and odd assumed manner contributed no doubt a good deal to the impression dear dear what pretty little darlings you all are she began looking at them one after another as sweet as sugar plums when you have your own way and are pleased eh dears but don't you think you can take old cookie in do you no no i know what ladies and gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen's young ladies and young gentlemen are pretty well dears i can tell you don't i know all about the shiny hair and smiling faces of the little pets in the parlour and how they leave parlour manners behind them sometimes when they run to the kitchen to cook and order her here and there and want half a dozen things at once and must and will have what they want and are for popping their fingers into every pie well well she proceeded 
the parlor's the parlor the kitchen's the kitchen and i'm only a cook but then i conduct myself as cook even when i'm in the scullery and i only wish ladies and ladies young ladies too would conduct themselves as ladies even when they come into the kitchen that's what i call being honourable and upright well dears i'll tell you how i came to know all about it you see i lived once in a family where there were no less than eight of those precious little pets and a precious time i had of it with them but to be sure now it's past and gone plenty of excuses for them poor things they were so coaxed and flattered and made so much of what could be expected from them but tiresome wilful ways without any sense if your mamma would but put you into the scullery young miss to learn to wash plates and scar the pans out she'd make a woman of you used i to think to myself when a silly child who thought itself very clever to hinder other people's work would come hanging about in the kitchen doing nothing but tease and find fault for that's what a girl can always do it was very aggravating you may be sure dears you see i can talk to you quite reasonably because you're so nicely behaved it was very aggravating of course but i used to make allowances for them says i to myself cook you've had the blessing of being brought up to hard work ever since you were a babby you've had to earn your daily bread nobody knows how that brings people to their senses till they've tried so don't you go and be cocky because ladies and gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen's young ladies and young gentlemen are not quite so sensible as you are who knows but what if you'd been born to do nothing you might have been no wiser than them it's lucky for you you're only a cook but don't you go and be cocky that's all make allowances it's the secret of life you see dears i did make allowances and after the eight little pets was safe in bed till next morning i used to feel quite composed and pitiful like towards them poor little dears but certainly when morning came and the oldest young master was home for the holidays it was trying time for me and i couldn't think of the allowances any longer either he wouldn't get up and come down till every one else had had their breakfast and so he wanted fresh water boiled and fresh tea made and another muffin toasted and more bacon fried or else he was up so outrageous early that he was scolding because there was no hot water before the fire was lit bless you he hadn't a bit of sense in his head poor boy not a bit and how should he why he went to school as soon as he was out of petticoats and was set to all that latin and greek stuff that never puts anything useful into folks heads but so much more chatter and talk so he came back as silly as he went poor thing dear me on a wet day after lesson time those boys were like so many crazy creatures cook i must make a pie says one there's a pie in the oven already master james says i i don't care about the pie in the oven says he i want a pie of my own bring me the flour and the water and the butter and all the things and above all the rolling pin and clear the decks will you i say for my pie here goes and here used to go my dears for master james had no sense as i told you and so he'd shove all my pots and dishes away one on the top of the other and let me be as busy as i would and dinner ever so near ready the dresser must be cleared and everything must give way to his pie his pie indeed i wish i had had the management of his pie just then i'd have taught him what it was to come shaking the rolling pin at the head of a respectable cook who wanted to get her business done properly as in duty bound but he wasn't the only one there was little whipper snapper his younger brother squeaking out in another corner i shan't make a pie james i shall make toffee it's far better fun you'd better come and help me where's the treacle pot cook cook i say cook where's the treacle pot and look at this stupid kettle and pan what's in the pan i wonder oh kidney beans who cares for kidney beans how can i make toffee when all these things are on the fire 
stay i'll hand them all off and sure enough if i hadn't rushed for master james who was drinking away at my custard out of the bowl to seize a whipper-snapper who had got his hand on the vegetable pan already he would have pulled it and the kettle and the whole concern off the fire and perhaps scalded himself to death then of course there comes a scuffle and master whipper-snapper begins to roar and out comes missus who poor thing had no more sense in her head than her sons though she'd never been to school to lose it over latin and greek and says she with all her ribbons streaming and her petticoat swelled out like a window curtain in a draught says she cook i desire that you will not touch my children as you please ma'am says i if you'll be so good as to stop the young gentleman from touching my pans and i was going to say custard but master james shouts out quite quick why i only wanted to make a pie mamma and i only wanted to make some toffee cries whipper snapper and then mamma answers like a duchess at court there can't be possibly any objection my dears and i wish cook you would be a little more good-natured to the children your temper is sadly against you and out she sails ribbons and window curtains and all and says i to myself as i cooled down for the young gentlemen luckily went away with their dear mamma says i to myself it's a very fine thing no doubt to go about in ribbons and petticoats and grand clothes but if one must needs carry such a poor silly head inside them as missus does i'd rather stop as i am and be a cook with some sense about me i shan't say my dears continued the supposed cook that i spoke very politely just then but who could feel polite when their dinner had been put back at least half an hour over such nonsense as that missus used to say the dear boys came to the kitchen on a wet day because they'd got nothing else to do nothing else to do and had learnt latin and greek and all sorts of schooling besides so much for education thought i why it would spoil the best lads that were ever born into the world for of course you know if these young gentlemen had been put to decent trades they'd have found something else to do with their fingers besides mischief and waste and dear me i talk about not having been polite to missus just then but now you tell me dears what missus with all her education would have said if she'd been in my place when one young gentleman was drinking her custard and another young gentleman was pulling her pans on the floor do you think that she'd have been a bit more polite than i was wouldn't she have called me all the stupid creatures that ever were born and told the story over and over to her friends an acquaintance to make them stare and say there were surely no such simpletons in the world as ladies and gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen young ladies and young gentlemen however i did not go as far as that because you see i had some sense about me and couldn't make allowances for all the nonsense the poor things are brought up to there was no resisting the twinkle in aunt judy's eye when she came to this point though it shone through an old pair of nurse's spectacles and the little ones clapped their hands and declared it was very bit as good as a cook's story only a great deal better that twinkle had quite brought aunt judy back to them again in spite of her cook's attire and number six cried out oh don't stop aunt judy do go on cookie dear do tell some more there now exclaimed aunt judy throwing herself back in the chair isn't that a regular young lady's question out and out who but a young lady with no more sense in her head than a pin would have thought of asking such a thing why miss is there a joint in the world that can bear basting for ever no no a time comes when it must be taken down if any goods to be left in it and so at the end of 3 years my basting time was over and the time for taking down was come cook says i to myself you must give in if you go on with those cherubs that was their company name you know much longer there won't be a bit of you left and sure enough that very morning dears 
they'd come down upon me with a fresh grievance and i couldn't stand it i really couldn't the sweeps had been by four o'clock to the kitchen chimney and i'd been up and toiling every minute since and hadn't had time to eat my breakfast when in they burst the young ladies not the sweeps dears i mean and there they broke out at once i hadn't fed their seagulls before breakfast a couple of dull-looking grey birds with big mouths that had come in a hamper overnight as a present to the cherubs and it seems i ought to have been up before daylight almost to look for slugs for them in the garden till they'd got used to the place oh these ladies and gentlemen if they'd need know something of some sort to make amends for there are many things they never know all their life long young ladies says i i didn't come here to get meals ready for seagulls but christian ladies and gentlemen if the seagulls want a cook your mamma must hire them one on purpose i've plenty to do for her and the family without looking after such nonsense as that that's what you always say whimpers the youngest miss and you know they don't want any cooking but only raw slugs and you know you might easily look for them because you've got nothing to do because it's such an easy place mamma always says but you're always cross mamma says that too and everybody knows you are because she tells everybody when little miss had got that out she thought she'd finished me up and so she had for when i heard that missus was so ungenteel to go on talking of what i did to all her acquaintance and had nothing better to talk about i made up my mind that i'd give notice that very day very well miss says i your mamma shall soon have something fresh to talk about and i hope she'll find it a pleasant change there were some of them knew that i meant at once for after they'd scampered off i heard shouts up and down the stairs from one or the to the other cook's going we shall have a new cook soon what a lark we'll have with the toffee and the pies we'll make her do just as we choose there now thought i to myself there'll be somebody else put down to baste before long well i'm glad my time's over and thereupon i fell to wishing i was back again in father and mother's rickety old cottage that i'd once been so proud to leave to go and live with gentlefolks but you see it was no use wishing for i'd my bread to earn and must turn out somewhere let it be as disagreeable as it would father and mother were dead and there was no rickety cottage for me to go back to so i wiped my eyes and told myself to make the best of what had to be well dears pursued cookie after a short pause during which the little ones looked far more inclined to cry than laugh missus was quite taken aback when she heard i wouldn't stay any longer cook she said i'm perfectly astonished at your want of sense in not recognizing the value of such a situation as mine and as to your complaints about the children anything more ridiculously unreasonable i have never heard such superior well-taught young people you are not very likely to meet with again in a hurry perhaps not ma'am says i in french and crochet and the piano and latin and things i don't understand being only a cook but i know what behaviour is and that's what i'm sure the young ladies and gentlemen have never been taught or if they have they are so slow at taking it in that i think i shall do better with a family where the behaviour lessons come first missus was very angry and so was i but at last she said cook i shall not argue with you any longer you know no better and i suppose i must make allowances for you i'm much obliged to you ma'am i'm sure was my answer it's what i've always done by you ever since i came to the house and i'll do it still with pleasure and think no more of what's been said i spoke from my heart i can tell you dears for i felt very sorry for missus and thought she was but a lady after all and perhaps i'd hardly made allowances though i'd lost my temper too as i knew after she went away but you see while she was there it was so mortifying to be spoken to as if all the sense was on her side when i knew it was all on mine wherever the french and crochet may have been well 
but on the day before i left i broke down with another of them as it's fair that you should know i'd felt very lonely that day as busy as i was and in the afternoon i took myself into the scullery to give the pans a sort of good-bye cleaning and be out of everybody's way but there in the midst of it comes the eldest young gentleman flinging into the kitchen shouting cook cook where's cook as usual i thought he was after some of his old tricks and i had been fretting over those pans thinking what a sad job it was to have no home to go to in the world so i gave him a very short answer master james says i i've done with nonsense now i can't attend to you you must wait till the next cook comes but master james came straight away to the scullery door and says he cook i'm not coming to tease i've brought you a needle book there cook it's full of needles i put them all in myself keep it please dear dear i can't forget it yet pursued cook how master james stood on the little stone step of the scullery with his arm stretched out and the needle book he'd brought for me in his hand i don't know how i thanked him i'm sure but i had to go back to the sink and wash the dirt off my hands before i could touch the pretty little thing and then i told him i would keep it as long as ever i lived and laughed cooky he laughed and says he now shake hands cooky and so we shook hands and then off he ran and i went back to my pans and fairly cried why cook says i to myself that lad's got as good a heart as your own after all and as to sense and behaviour they haven't been forced on him yet as they have upon you latin's latin and conduct's conduct and one doesn't teach the other and it's too bad to expect more of people than what they've had opportunity for well dears that was the rule i always went by and i've been in many situations since with single ladies and single gentlemen and large families and all and there was something to put up within all of them and they always told me there was a good deal to put up with in me and perhaps there was however it doesn't matter as long as missus and servant go by one rule to make allowances and not expect more from people than what they've had opportunity for and above all never to be cocky when all the advantage is on their side it's a good rule dears and will stop many a foolish word and idle tale if you'll go by it aunt judy had finished at last and she took off the old spectacles and laid them on the doll's table and paused it is a good rule observed number four and i shall go by it and not tell real cook stories when i grow up i hope i love old cooky cried number six getting up and hugging her around the neck but it's wrong aunt judy to tell funny make-believe cook stories like ours not at all number six replied aunt judy my private belief is that if you tell funny make-believe cook stories while you're little you will be ashamed of telling stupid real ones when you're grown up end of cook's stories